Okay, here, here's a question that came uh, via Facebook. Are you, are you on Facebook? No. Okay. <laughs> not, not to my Did knowledge. Did I say good? I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, this is from Grace Wing Yuan Toy, uh, who's asking about, do you see, uh, where do you see media going as the internet, and she says, has taken over for most Americans' outlet for news? What do you, how, how, how do you see the internet as a, as a medium for news? Um, it is clearly an extraordinarily influential, growing, and useful medium for news. Uh, and to the degree that people are getting uh, you know, NPR on the internet, or the New York Times on the internet, or the Wall Street Journal on the internet, to the degree that there are uh, extraordinarily uh, interesting uh, internet outlets like Politico.com or the Daily Beast or any number of others out there. Uh, I th you know, the world has been changed by that, and I don't think it will ever change back again. What worries me about the internet is that it is, in certain instances, all but impossible to ascertain the, the, the background of some of the people who are putting information onto a blog, let's say. Who are those bloggers? Some of them may be known, others may not. It is entirely possible, for example, I mean, one of the advantages about uh, listening to Robert Siegel on, on All Things Considered is, uh, as you've heard, Robert has been around NPR for a very long time. <laughs> you have become familiar with him. You became familiar with me over a very long time, over ABC. You know that each of us has to work with a number of colleagues. Uh, sometimes they are editors, sometimes they are producers, sometimes they are other journalists. But we don't just put information on the air without it being checked and double-checked by others. And the organizations for which we work, and I'm proud to say I, I, I do work a little bit for NPR, I think it's one of the best outfits out there right now, they would be devastated if I put something on the air that turned out to be inaccurate. And obviously, I would have to correct it, they would have to correct it. They have a reputation at stake. The trouble with a blog is that you don't know who the blogger is. Sometimes you may, but sometimes you have no idea who the blogger is. And yet this information is out there, uh, and it, I'll, I'll give you a tiny little example. In the PR that uh, they did for this event tonight, 92nd Street Y put out something that said, I had won six Emmys over the course of my career. Uh, and I thought to myself, you know, am, am, I, am, I gonna, am I gonna make a thing about it? It was actually 42 Emmys, but somewhere on the internet, <laughs> Somewhere on the internet, it it's, said... It's close. It's close six. Huh? Close enough. <laughs> it said six. That is now going to be repeated. I'm going to be running up against those six Emmys for the rest of my life now. <laughs> That's going to be out there somewhere. Is it trivial? You bet it's trivial. But there is other information out there that is not trivial, that is important. You don't know, for example, when... I, I, I think when the demonstrations in Tehran broke out a few months back and we were getting information that was being tweeted and coming in on the internet, I think that information was probably accurate because the Iranian government was unprepared. Next time, they will be prepared. And what comes over on Twitter and what comes over on various blogs may be legitimate or it may be something that Iranian intelligence has put out. We don't know. That's what worries me about some of the new technology. Not that I don't understand its importance, not that I don't understand uh, you know, how enormously useful it can be, but that it can also uh, spread bad information so widely, so quickly, and it's terribly hard to remedy once that happens. Okay. You go back to WMCA radio. I do. I just, I, I wonder whether, as I'm asking you as a radio person, whether your memories of local radio and of that particular radio station are fond ones. Uh, do you, 
Do you think of it as merely been prologue to television? You will, you, will, you will have to accept my word of honor on this. Robert does not know the story that I'm going to tell you. He does not even know that there is such a story that I'm going yeah. to tell you. But I was in 1962, what used to be known as a copy boy. That was back in the days when you could still use terms like that. I was a copy boy. I would, I would rip wire copy off the, off the wire service machines from the Associated Press and United Press International and Reuters, and I would bring it to the demigods who would read the news every hour. <laughs> and one night, I was performing my duties as a copy boy at WMCA, and the Barry Gray Show was on. And he had had, earlier in the evening, two great Hollywood figures on the program, Boris Karloff and Peter Lorre. <laughs> and they'd been on the program about an hour earlier, and I hear Barry Gray saying, I know there are a lot of cab drivers who listen to this show, and I just want to tell you, in those days, WMCA was above the Longchamps restaurant and bar. He said, you know that Boris Karloff and Peter Lorre were here an hour ago. It was, a, it was a blustery winter night. I mean, the snow was coming down, and they couldn't get a cab. So if there are any cab drivers out there, stop by, <laughs> stop by the Longchamps, and, and you can pick up Peter Lorre and Boris Karloff. Well, I heard that. I had my car, my old 57 Chevy parked around the corner, I go racing downstairs to the long shops, and sure enough, there they are sitting at the bar. And I say, my name's Ted Cobble. And I'm a, uh, I work upstairs at WMC, and Barry Gray just said, you're having trouble getting a cab, and my car is just around the corner, and may I drive you wherever you want to go? And they say, sure. So I get the car. And now I've got Boris Karloff and Peter Lorre <laughs> in the back of my 57 Chevy. And I drive up Madison Avenue and I hang a left on 59th Street and then I start coming through the park. One of them had an apartment at the Dakota on, on 72nd Street. And all of a sudden, my car stops. <laughs> and the two of them are having a great time. He seems like such a nice young man. <laughs> You don't think he's, he's playing a game with us, do you? <laughs> no, I can't imagine that he would. <laughs> I'm dying. I mean, dying. I've got Peter Lorre and Boris Karloff, and my car won't start, right? So I, fi I finally managed to get, I mean, the, the, the story kind of ends there, because I, I managed to get him a cab, and I got my car towed, and the next day, at WMCA, they had sent over a case of sherry. Isn't that a lovely story? Yeah.